Welcome to another West Tokyo Jolt podcast. I'm your intrepid host, Jason Pratt, the president of the chapter, and I'm joined with Tim Andrew Artha, who is working with the British Council and a member of our chapter. Today we're at the Pan Sig 2019 conference held in Nishinomiya, Hyogo Prefecture. Tim has just given a presentation. And I'd like to follow up with him on that and develop the conversation a bit. So, Tim, welcome. Hi, Jason. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Could we start by me asking you to tell briefly what you talked about? Yeah, of course. Yeah, my、uh, presentation was about my master's dissertation research, and the title was "Learner Attitudes into a Global Approach in A Kaiwa." And quite often in、uh, a Kaiwa, so the English conversation schools, they tend to focus on British or American English and Western culture. But since English is used all over the world,、uh, it may be time to change that. And I wanted to investigate the attitude of the learners to find out what attitudes they have towards a more global approach. It revealed some different attitudes. Part of the approach is listening to global Englishes, and another part is about cultural differences. They were a little bit negative about listening to global Englishes, but they were positive about learning about cultural differences. So I kind of suggest that if they're combined, you know, the interest in cultural differences can be used to、uh, encourage them to listen to global Englishes. We've seen people talk about a similar type of issue in the past, and of course, your own research draws upon research done. Before this is the first time that I've noticed it applied to an Aikaiwa environment. Is it the first that you know of? Yes, it is. Most of the research that I was reading was done in universities. For overseas listeners, an Aikaiwa is an English conversation school outside a degree-giving academic facility or so. People will send、uh, their children there to learn English, maybe to supplement what they're doing at school or to get a head start. Some people who are doing High school, junior high school, university again to supplement, and then you get a lot of adults also who go because their formal education is completed, and they're going to learn in this environment that provides them the opportunity to do so. Getting towards this thing, could you tell us where you work now and how you went about getting their approval to do this research? I now work at the British Council, but that's not where I did the research. That was at a previous a, one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So、mm-hmm. let's focus on the previous one. Many of the A Kaiwa schools use the <coughs> feature of a native teacher as a selling point within、yes. their own business model and such. And yes. To get more deep into that, they they consider native teachers basically. British, American, Australian, New Zealanders, and I found a lot less Kiwis around than the other three,、mm. and Canadians. I used to work for a major Aikaiwa as well. That was their approach as well. It's now defunct. Okay. Yeah, definitely. To get the school where the teacher would work to accept somebody that didn't fit into that teacher from one of the four countries I mentioned,、mm-hmm. sometimes it was a struggle. Despite many students. Maybe initially having reservations because they were sold this other ideal, quickly learning to love a teacher from another environment or,、yeah. or from another background or such, and, and very popular teachers, right? Yeah. So, if this is a business model to use this so-called native teacher, and I say so-called not because they aren't native speakers, but because they've redefined and limited what that includes, how do you overcome this? As a selling point, or do you need to overcome this as a selling point in order to include more world Englishes within the lesson? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I mean, actually, in the school I was working in, in the particular place, actually there was a, a quite a good variety teachers from different countries. Okay, actually, oh, it's quite good. Were they teachers who had lived in a, a native English-speaking country for a period of time? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, so, so yeah, global English. They might really actually represent it. Yeah, but the company may still be marketing them as something different. Yeah, yeah. I, I do know definitely. Yeah, on the sales points, when customers come in, they do often ask where the teacher's from,、mm-hmm. and they have a very that's that's quite often seems to be more important than、uh, their teacher's experience or qualifications. Sure, in an Aikaiwa, yeah, which is a bit, yeah. 
you hear that again and again. They'll come in and they're quite often specifically <coughs> asking, you know, they want teacher, British mm -hmm. or American teachers or they have this idea. So sure. it's quite difficult to cha change that attitude. But I think if, like in my research showed that although they were a bit wary of listening to global Englishes, they mm -hmm. were positive about learning about cultural differences. Mm -hmm. So by using that element to get them to listen to more global Englishes, then that will help change their attitude. So even if the teacher they expect could be a British or American teacher, but if their content of the lesson includes this different culture and different Englishes, that will help to change that attitude, and then that will help to change the way they perceive things. Great. You're leading right into another point that I'm <laughs> going to ask about then, which is a lot of the Akaiwas also develop their own texts, listening materials yeah. and such. And that's another um, marketing tool that they use. Yeah. In fact, I had written text for another major Akaiwa, which was Eon for a while. Ah, I uh, and I found Eon to be very good in their considerations of how they develop textbooks. But yeah. uh, again, that was a selling point. So if a teacher wanted to diversify the types of English as used in listenings and such. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could fit within a typical Akaiwa classroom structure, or would there be some sort of uh, negotiation that would have to go on within the company to get that to fit in? With my research, I was hoping by showing their attitudes, that could be used to encourage them to change the textbooks. In the Akaiwa, I did the research, they do make their own textbooks. Mm -hmm. Those textbooks do focus on native speakers and the contexts of the lessons. They usually have some situation that's very Western. Mm -hmm. And even like there's a, there is a listening which takes place supposedly in Thailand, but it's basically British people on holiday in Thailand. I got and you. just British people yeah. speaking to each other. Sure. And it's a missed opportunity when you could have people from different countries, someone from Thailand sure. and then other travelers speaking to each other, which would be... I think would be a lot more interesting rather than basically British people speaking in the same way as they speak in the UK to each other. Uh, it'd be good if they, I, I would hope that they would consider to start including more different kinds of English and more cultural, different cultural things into the lesson. Because mm -hmm. clearly, particularly the, in my research, the learners were quite positive about learning about cultural differences. I did actually try, in my research they hadn't, experience the global approach. They, mm -hmm. It was just kind of asking, like, hypothetically, what would they think of it? But then after I did the research, I did try it in some of the lessons using different videos from YouTube and getting discussions going. So before they'd watch a video, mm -hmm. I'd give them the questions that are asked in the video, like in a street interview, and they discuss them. Then they watch the video, find out what the people actually said in India or in Singapore. And then it would create kind of discussions and they were really into it, really interested and motivated. So I think if that could be used to develop materials, I think it would be really successful. And it's probably probably a case of which a Kiowa decides to go in that direction first, they'd be ahead of the others, I think. Well, that's an excellent selling point <laughs> for uh, yeah. an Akaiwa considering to make a alteration is to set themselves apart through this, yeah. as you say, to be first. I would say that for those who are required to teach a text, and I, I want to say West Tokyo, Jal has no aspirations to change how an Akaiwa does things, nor mm -hmm. do we want to say that uh, one material is better than another within them. Mm -hmm. But since the students buy the textbooks, of course, it's often the onus of the teacher to make sure that they feel that it was used and worthwhile within an yeah. Akaiwa tech or class, right? So another idea might be to maybe build a bit upon what you said, but to say it in, in my own words, is to supplement what you have by maybe having the listening that is provided by the, the Akawa-generated text, yeah. plus a similar conversation mm -hmm. that maybe you can find, or a similar environment, a conversation in an environment, mm -hmm. to supplement that. And you can sometimes, if they're spot on uh, in the same vein, you could compare them. Otherwise, you can build upon it and show another scenario. If you're very lucky, you could maybe have some friends from different environments around, and you could ask them to record a few conversations for you that are on different themes, mm. and then also compare that, and then you would have generated your own very near that. In the Tokyo area, or for example, another major metropolitan area, we do have that advantage of having people from around the world who could 
uh, probably in exchange for a beer or something yeah. help you out, right? <laughs> okay, so moving on from there, you talked about the culture and teaching that within, and you just mentioned that a lot of students were open to this kind of cultural thing. Yeah. I have a few questions on this series, but yeah. what kind of cultural issues were students showing a lot of interest in? So, yeah, I combined the listening to global Englishes with learning about cultural differences and found some street interviews, some of them in India, some of them in Singapore, and they're talking about cultural things. I mean, I started off with ones related to language and uh, English. One of them is asking people in India about English, about kind of Indian English, and what they think about the way Indian English is perceived in Western media. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of brings up The Simpsons, and mm -hmm. the character in The Simpsons who has an Indian accent is kind of asking people, like, in India, how do they feel about that? Kind of people are kind of laughing at Indian mm -hmm. English. It's kind of made, made a joke and asking what they feel about it. And it's quite interesting, maybe for the Japanese learners to see that because the response was actually people are quite kind of proud mm. of their English the way they speak they're like this is our identity and uh, the Japanese learners in my class came away from that saying well maybe they, are, they were kind of not confident about their English about kind of like Japanese English so that you know their aim was maybe to sound like British or American, okay. but they saw like in India, they're proud of the way they speak and it's their identity. So mm -hmm. I think for them, that, that, I mean, that is a cultural thing. That's a cultural difference about the way people feel about English. And then a similar thing in Singapore, there's a street interview which is asking Singaporeans what they think about other Singaporeans who have a non-Singapore accent. So mm -hmm. they speak with like a British accent or American accent. Sure. Actually, in Singapore, they're generally a bit suspicious if they meet a Singaporean who doesn't have a Singapore accent, hmm. who has like a more British or American aware accent. Of that. Yeah, so okay. that was quite interesting because the Japanese learners is thinking, well, that's the aim. The aim mm -hmm. is to sound British or American, but in Singapore, it's, according to the people in this interview, they're like, actually, no. Their point was, though, if the person is putting the accent on, if it is their sure. natural accent, okay. they're like, okay, but some people might put it on and it's a little bit like they're looking down on them. Whereas, actually, if you just show your identity, you're. The, so I think that was quite an opening thing for Japanese learners. The movie, I don't think, draws upon it as much mm -hmm. as the book Crazy Rich Asians, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with this uh, movie or book. They make very clear that the main rich family had very British-style accents, mm -hmm. and I wonder if that author associated that with being wealthy or, or what, I'm not sure, or oh, okay. if, mm -hmm. if now that I read it with the insight you gave me, if I'll mm -hmm. see something different about how they're treated mm -hmm. within Singapore in this. Quite interesting. One great mind within this kind of line of thinking is fellow educator Parissa Mehran. Mm -hmm. She wrote once that when you think of inclusion, you have to also think who's being excluded. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you're going to teach culture within the classroom, which countries do you choose and how do you do that so that somebody doesn't feel left out? There's so many nations around and mm -hmm. even more so there's so many cultures within those nations. How do you go about choosing what you teach? Yeah, it's a very good point. And I did try kind of with some of my classes using mm -hmm. some theory like Hofstede's cultural dimensions mm -hmm. and they can kind of be used to compare like all different cultures. Yeah, so that was really focusing on just culture and maybe a bit too much theory, mm -hmm. which is why I did develop into using the videos because that kind of worked a bit better. But you can use theory that's kind of covering more stuff, but it's a bit mm -hmm. difficult to use that in a classroom. Sure. Of course, one way to go about it is to try and figure which country's peoples your students would interact most with, perhaps. Yes. Right? But, yeah, so many ways to think about But I think it's something worth thinking about when you go in towards this. Yeah, definitely. And the same would be what kind of cultural aspects we're teaching. Is it just a trivial nature? Is it something useful to them? For example, how to apologize, how to uh, greet people around the world would probably be more useful, and the various holidays of the world would be more trivial. Yeah. It doesn't make them not worth usage in a lesson, mm -hmm. 
because it might be something where we're explaining cultures to somebody else or where we're uh, planning a trip for somewhere and we're going to mm-hmm. go see these things. But how we use them and such, it's, again, worth considering, I think. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, definitely. So I'm interested, mm-hmm. if you were to do a kind of part two to this or something like this within our chapter, yeah. what could you focus on that you didn't touch upon today? Or what could you go in more in depth on, for example? Well, I think my kind of next step would be to move more into using the global approach with university students because, yeah, I'm, I'm teaching at university now. So I'd like to kind of use the same approach so kind of using YouTube videos, which have global Englishes and also diff- discussions about cultural differences, but try using them with university students. Mm. And I'd like to see the kind of attitudes the university students have. So it'd be good to find out that attitudes before. Great, great. And then, and then afterwards and compare how I would it changes. Also, yeah, I would also like to see a, a how-to yeah. series from you, you know. Uh, this time you talked about what are their attitudes, so building upon that now, mm. how to do this, whether that's how to change their attitudes or how to be more global in the classroom. I think mm-hmm. both could be great Oh yeah, uh, definitely. presentations by you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then in closing, is there anything that you want to tell our listeners about upcoming in your own research presentations or anything of this nature? After doing this, presentation today my next step will be to like submit a paper for the post-conference journal so yeah hopefully excellent you might see it there (laughs) if it gets published let us know we'd like to share a way to view that whether that's a link or contact your local jolt office and ask for a subscription or or whatever yeah that happens well thank you so much for your time today and for the the presentation i enjoyed it oh you're very welcome jason thanks a lot I'd like to take this last part of this podcast to mention the videos that were referenced by Tim. Those include uh, the Indian street interview that he mentioned, which is a video called Do Indians Know How Their Accent Sounds? And if you want to access that through YouTube, you can use the channel Asian Boss. The Singaporean street interview video is called What Do People Think of Singaporeans with Angmo accents, and please forgive me if my pronunciation of that word is wrong. It's from a program called Word on the Street on the YouTube channel, The Smart Local. Thank you as always for listening to us. I look forward to joining you with another wonderful interviewee and hopefully seeing you at one of West Tokyo JALT's upcoming events. (laughs) 